A very good afternoon to all present today. On behalf of the English department at Christo Jayanti, I extend a warm welcome to all of you for the panel discussion on day one of our virtual national conference on life narratives. The topic for our panel discussion is the discourse of life narratives, a dialogue. And to carry the dialogue forward, we have on board with us three expert panelists. It gives me at most pleasure to introduce them to you all. Dr. Rani P. L. is an associate professor and head of the Department of English Language and Literature at Sri Satya Sai Institute of Higher Learning, Anantapur, Andhra Pradesh. Dr. Rani is an accomplished academic in the field of literary studies and is a part of several academic committees, including ELTAI and the Indian Society for Commonwealth Studies. Her areas of expertise ranges from post-colonial literature, media linguistics, Indian writing in English, witness literature to academic writing. We are honored to have you here with us, ma'am. I'm sure the years long of experience of Dr. Rani would be resourceful to our session. Ma'am will be taking us through life writing, reasons, reading and ramifications. The second panelist is Dr. Preeti Kumar. She's an assistant professor at St. Risa's College, Ernagulam, Kerala. Dr. Preeti is a much sought after and deeply respected professor for scores of undergraduate and postgraduate scholars. Her erudite scholarship and research into areas including biographies, gender and Gandhian studies, graphic biographies establishes her expertise for the theme of this panel discussion. Dr. Preeti will be enlightening us on the topic of biopics and ideology, and we look forward to it, ma'am. Our third panelist is Dr. Prayer Elmo Raj. He's an assistant professor at the PG and Research Department of English, Pachaya Pass College, Chennai, Tamil Nadu. His interests include literary theory, alternative epistemologies, and so on. An experienced teacher, Dr. Prayer has a number of books and research articles to his credit as well. So we'll walk us through the genre of auto-ethnobiography as method. We are indeed grateful for your esteemed presence here with us today, sir. We welcome you wholeheartedly to this panel discussion, dear professors. This panel discussion will be moderated by our very own Dr. V.P. Krishnaprabha, ma'am, head PG Department of English at Christo Jayanti College, whose expert is in the areas of post-colonial literature, cultural studies, indigenous studies, and youth and children on the margins would benefit this session enormously. Welcome, ma'am. We are honored to have you all here and look forward to a captivating session ahead. I hand over the session to Dr. Krishna Prabha, ma'am. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Rini. Good afternoon, everyone. First, I would like to congratulate the organizers of this conference. They have lined up a long line of diverse and distinguished speakers and panelists. We have already been given a very, very good insights to, into stories as narratives, as narratives of identity, as testimonials of social history in the keynote and the plenary session by Professor Nandini Sahu and Professor Marx. Professor Nandini Sahu was telling during the keynote that writing is her survival strategy, the agency. Everything in our life, from the everyday to the extraordinary, is a story waiting to be told. Bell Hooks, the African-American critic and activist, describes her struggles to write an auto autobiography. To quote Hooks, to take an excerpt from her writing, to me, telling the story of my growing up years was intimately connected with the longing to kill the self I was without really having to die. I wanted to kill that self in writing. Once that was gone out of my life forever, I could more easily become the me of me. It was clearly the Gloria gene of my tormented and anguished childhood that I wanted to be rid of, the girl who was always wrong, always punished, always subjected to some humiliation or other, always crying, the girl who was to end up in a mental institution because she could not be anything but crazy or so they told her. Uh, we all of us know that Bill Hooks is the pen name of Gloria Jean. Uh, and she always, she wanted the message to be conveyed, the message to be prominent, message to be significant, better than her name. So she 
uh, made it a point to use her uh, uh, you know she uh, she preferred to use lower case for her uh, name b bell hooks b and h small letters she was the girl who sat hot iron on her palm on her arm pleading with them to leave her alone the girl who wore her scar is a brand marking her madness even now i can hear the voices of my sister saying she says mama make gloria stop crying by writing the autobiography it was not just this gloria i would be rid of but the past that had a hold on me that kept me from the present i wanted not to forget the past but to break its hold this death in writing was to be liberatory she says it took some time to write to write the autobiography and the longer it took me to begin the process of writing autobiography the further removed from those memories i was becoming here the life becomes the text the ordinary becomes extraordinary to the morning uh professor nandini saw she actually took us through the basics of creative writing and she was uh telling about you know the she was talking about the primary and the secondary imagination how the mind acts as a catalyst what is the kind of chemical reaction is happening there and you know how you are when you become a writer how you are detached from your own self so the same thing bell hook says in her writing in you know, her struggles to write an autobiography that she, it was liberatory to her whether we are reading the autobiographies of benjamin franklin or yusuf sai malala marchinlo marchna navratloa or andre agassi or mother teresa or marchlo the king or mahatma gandhi or any of the or any of the celebrities they all have a different stories to tell stories of narration stories of identity stories of pain and stories of nostalgia and stories of trauma and stories of uh, crises and conflict that they have faced in life with this note i would like to take you to the three resourceful panelists dr rani dr preeti and dr preyo i welcome you all to this panel discussion dr rani she has already been introduced she is the head of the department of english at satyasai institute of higher learning andhra pradesh ma'am over to you and we do hope that we are going to have a very valuable exchange of ideas on life writing and discourses thank you ma'am i hope my audio is clear yes very much i hope that is visible yes thank you good afternoon everybody greetings from the shri satyasai institute of high learning a deemed to be university of nearly four decades greetings to my fraternity english fraternity of crystal jayanti college and congratulations on the very fascinating and very exciting topic that you've chosen for this particular conference dear fellow academicians and participants of this conference it gives me really really great pleasure to be talking on this topic that excites me and this excitement is universal because we never tire of uh, being interested in people's lives that's a uh, second nature to human beings right being interested in human lives before i go into my essential talk as a personal habit please permit me to offer my prayers which i consider like sri aurobindo said is a master act and a king idea which helps to link man's minuscule strength to a transcendent force which i believe is also the source of life and everything that comes with it which is for us the content of our life writing the minute i received my invite to be a panelist at this conference i gave myself a litmus test i asked myself because uh, i am not someone who subscribes easily to those convoluted terms couched in theories 
I am and I wish to be a practicing speaker and a practicing reader and a practicing academician. So I said, I'm going to earn my right to speak for a couple of minutes at this conference. If and only if my reading list of life writing has crossed at least half a dozen. So that's when for the first time I sat down to enlist all that I had read in life writing. And what I got luckily is a list of a little more than half a dozen, probably touching a dozen itself. I'm deliberately using this to launch my talk because I believe that there are a lot of students in our audience. And in today's times of a waning interest in reading, I thought the primary duty of a teacher like me and you in the audience is to inspire our students to read in the first place. All research, all academic work will be fruitful and substantial only when there has been enough reading. So I looked at this list, this is not all, but I looked at this list and told myself, now maybe I can say something about life writing. So before I really go into talking about uh, life writing, I would uh, think that you can guess the writers of these books, at least a couple of them, if you can put on the chat box, if you can identify who the writers of these books are, that will be interesting to know. Are we getting some answers on the chat box? I'm on a full screen, so I wouldn't actually... Right. Uh, I, I'm sure some of you are wanting to put it on the chat box, some writers uh, that you identify of the books here. For want of time, let me go ahead. If I asked to uh, the young audience here to name a few sports person, I would think that we would get an immediate answer. If I asked you to name a couple of novelists, I'm sure you will reel out names like Thomas Hardy or Charles Dickens or Vikram Seth or Chetan Bhagat. If I asked you for poets, you would immediately tell me Wordsworth, Coleridge, Shelley, Keats, and so on. Even non-literature students would be able to mention these names. But I presume if I asked you to name a couple of life writers, we're going to have some trouble. I do not know if with equal ease we are able to reel out a list of life writers that we know of or we have read. That's why I have added one in my brackets to the popularity of life writers. And I have my own reasons why I think life writing and life writers are not yet as accepted as uh, certain other literary artists. And the first reason, life writing is ubiquitous. It is all around us. When I lie on my couch and I'm reflecting of what I did in my past and I have regrets, I have uh, glories, I have achievements that I'm content with. And I think of my future, I am essentially life writing in my thoughts. When I wake up and talk to my family or friends about what I did and what I've been doing and what I intend to do, I am life writing in some sense. When I listen to my friends and family tell me about what they did, what they like, what they think, it is life writing of some sort. When I turn on the television and listen to a television show and I hear what Trump did or Biden did, I am actually listening to some life writing. When I turn the pages of the newspaper and again reading about the lives of somebody affected by the floods or somebody who got the Nobel Prize or maybe it's a season of the Oscars and so on. So life writing is something that is all around us. And like, like um, Hayden White said, narrativity and life cannot be dissociated. Narration is life and life is narration. They, they cannot be distinct. And as long as that is the case, Life writing is all around us. 
since it is all around us it is a little uh, probably difficult for us to look at it as an object meant for serious critical intervention as a genre of literature that needs to be uh, prescribed in university syllabi and studied by research scholars this is precisely why life writers and life writing as yet has not probably become a part of our life because it's all around and what is all just like the oxygen that is all around and we don't particularly see it or feel it or think of it life writing is all around us my second reason and this is what george painter and once again he was the uh, biographer of uh, michael proust the french novelist so this is what he has to say about life writing the artist has creative imagination the biographer recreate and the re brings all the difference an artist you know especially after the age of enlightenment and the romantic age creation uh, composition original creative writing uh, was given all the trust therefore there's very little chance that something like a biography or life writing in general receives as much attention as creative writing because it is recreative and not exactly creative by recreative of course as we go on we will discuss a little more uh, by being recreative he can only recreate what already exists the reality you could ask the jk rowling for example did harry potter really do this and she can with confidence cocksurety say yes but one couldn't do that to a biographer or not a biographer because there is so much of closeness to reality in the recreation of the product this probably is another of the reasons why life writers are not yet known because they are not creative artists they are recreative artists and my third reason life writers are considered by carol angier as immigrants into literature there is a very narrow line where a fiction and non fiction gets divided the separation is so uh, so gray and so narrow that literary artists have their own reservations in accepting life writing or had their own reservations maybe is better said into life writing Uh, in fact as we go ahead and also from dr marx's talk in the morning we heard how life writing has a lot to do with history itself testimonials as social history is what he spoke about so uh, a literary artist would rather have life writers belong to the school of historians rather than be immigrants into the field of literature you know everybody the natives always look at immigrants with fear and suspicion because uh immigrants uh, have a have an impact on the labor the work style the work techniques employment opportunities and so on similarly there seems to be a reservation amongst literary writers in easily including biographers autobiographers life writers into uh, this reservation is largely fading out in today's world and the fact that the department of english language and literature is hosting the conference on life writing itself shows that we have been able to break free from this kind of a thinking there are certain ramifications complexities in life writing is life writing an art or is it a craft and what is the difference if it is an art it is open ended there is freedom there isn't a prescribed a format expected but if it is a craft one has to learn the technique so would a life writer learn the technique of memoir writing or testimonial writing or 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 a, a biographical writing um in comparison to a novelist who does not probably have to learn certain techniques uh, consciously uh, life writing is it objective it is is it subjective objective because you have to state the facts that you received from your research into the life of someone whether it's your own or somebody else's objectively but still 
it is subjective it is as someone saw it it is as your subject perceived it it is as you yourself perceived it there is the sure possibility of some amount of subjectivity even in the objective rendering of facts of someone's life is it history is it literature i already spoke about this a little bit and let me show you the next slide sometime in 2000 in the university of nebraska lincoln the department of history held a symposium on the topic biography and historical analysis and who were the people who were present six prominent historians of different fields why because they were called to reflect on their experiences as biographers doesn't it say something about biographers having been from the field of history so like i mentioned slowly it is opening up because uh, there is a narrow uh, div divide today between history and literature when it comes to life writing if you look at the genesis and the gear shifts over time the birth of life writing itself if you take back to maybe 4th century the first of the instances we have heard is confessions of saint augustine and you go down into literature you will come to john bunyan and his grace abounding which is autobiographical the minute i looked at these two and a couple of other texts from other civilizations other regions uh, one realizes that very often life writing has had its origins in the past in spiritual or religious thinking and my own conjecture is that to be able to do a sincere and a substantial right life writing exercise one needs to turn inward a little bit because one needs to capture the inner life in of, of whether uh, the subject of your biography or the subject of your autobiography which is you yourself it's only the inward gaze that will give you the opportunity to capture that life this probably explains why most life writing in the past had spiritual and religious leanings if you look at the eastern scenario the five books of the bible by moses and uh, since we are talking from the indian perspective i personally would like to look at it what's the whole idea of discussing an entire academic topic from a western theoretical perspective and because we are all the time used to borrowing what the west thought and taught us to think so i want to look at it from the indian perspective and from what is actually happening around us like i told you i am not a theory person i want to be a practical academician so the first thing that struck me when i thought of the indian perspective of this was sage valmiki and sage vyasa were probably the first biographers in our culture they basically wrote down the life of an entire dynasty an entire clan maybe an entire yuga is captured in those two epics that we have moses he didn't write about one individual he wrote about israelites he wrote about the ancestors of israel he wrote about uh, what mattered to the progression or the regression of that entire community so that's why my second point the shrinking scope if you looked at the earlier writings most life writing uh, had as an objective capturing human progression the progression of a civilization the progression of an entire dynasty or a clan and when you come down later let's say let's take kalidasa here the kumara sambhava is also life writing because he wrote about the birth of lord shiva's son raghuvamsha is also the story of rama which he wrote about so so life writing continued in some form or the other just that we didn't have these fancy terms in those days to call them by those names you come down later you find that there is life writing hagiographies you know life writing of saints and uh, ramkrishna paramahamsa or chaitanya mahaprabhu and uh, different saints mother teresa and so 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 on you come down further you find that most biographies autobiographies life writing has been on social reformers 
has been on sages and saints, social reformers, freedom fighters, writers, people of a social standing. You come further down, we also have life writings on families, whether it's the Jamsha Jitata, whether it is uh, you know, certain other important families which were known uh, in the country as a whole. And today, if you compare that scenario, you find a very individualized life writings. The world and the society today, the postmodern society has grown individualized. So also, I believe life writing. That's why I said shrinking scope of life writing because what began as capturing the progression of human evolution itself or of communities and civilizations today captures personality developments of individuals who may or may not matter in a society. So uh, there is this question of, has there been a shrinking scope? The scope and aspiration, there has been a seismic shift in the scope and aspiration of life writing itself. Is it positive? Is it negative? I wouldn't comment. If you thought it was negative, that's because we are not capturing uh, more comprehensive, because there, there, there are these thoughts that autobiographical writings are cultural documents. So unless you dissociate it from ex exclusive individual lives to the life of a community of a civilization, it would never be cultural documents. But on the other hand, if you thought it was positive to have individualized portraits, that's because you can have a very close microscopic view of individual lives, which might have another purpose altogether to its readers. In the good old days, traditionally, we heard of biographies and autobiographies. That were the simple terms we knew when we were young and we were students of literature. But today, there are multiple subgenres that have come up. Uh, it, 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 diary writing, personal essays, memoirs, reminiscences, testimonials, uh, name it, and all of it or most of it come under these subgenres. So it is getting more and more micro in our context shrinking. In fact, uh, while talking about shrinking scope, one thing that I should probably mention is today, people don't even write a complete uh, autobiography or biography. They write parts of their life. For example, the very latest one that you have is Priyanka Chopra, your favorite PC. And uh, we all know the title is Unfinished, precisely because she just talks about 20 plus years of her career. It's only that facet of her life. Or take the example of uh, the Commonwealth of Cricket by Ramchandra Guha. He talks about so beautifully, but only just one facet of his life as a fan of cricket, as a player of cricket, as an administrator of cricket, just about cricket. And that's a fantastic memoir. These are what we've got recently. So today we are not even talking about one individual's entire life. We're talking about one facet of partial years of a person's life. That is the scope, shrinking scope of today's life writing. And the multiple sharp genres only add to it because when you're writing a memoir, you can be fragmented. You, when you're writing a diary you, or a personal essay, you can just write it in bits and pieces. You don't have to have uh, the epic stature that the life writing of the past had. The next two points I'm going to discuss a little bit more in the coming slides. I wish to call it micro life writing, which is what we are in. Everybody calls this the age of the memoir boom, but I like to call it the age of the micro life writing. And why that? Because there is a new medium now to write. We began with WordPress and other blogging sites. We have Facebook posts, we have WhatsApp chats, we have uh, 280 character tweets, and we have Insta pics. From the epic, we have moved to the Insta. And can we consider these as also bits and pieces of life writing? It's a question that I want uh, budding researchers in this, uh, in this gathering to think of. Academicians should give a serious thought to. Will there be five years or 10 years from now, uh, any of us talking at a conference which consists of life writing in the new social media? My second question to you, for you to think of. I, my idea today is only to uh, provoke certain thoughts and certain debates. The next question is, supposing over a period of 10 years, we collected the tweets or the Facebook posts of an individual, 
collating and putting it together chronologically, would that more or less amount to becoming a piece of life writing? Would that in some sense be a substitute for an autobiography? These are questions to think of in our times. And the life writing that happens to social media has another plus and minus again. Something that happened just about five, five to six days ago. Uh, if you have watched it already in the media, well and good, let me otherwise explain this. A couple of years ago, your favorite Jasprit uh, Bumra, the cricketer, when he wished everybody happy Diwali, he added hashtag say no to crackers, positively discouraging people from using crackers that pollute the atmosphere. And last week at his wedding, the pictures that emerged showed uh, crackers all around him. And the Twitterati and others did not spare him. Trolling is what happens immediately. And what began for him as say no to crackers, which is a reflection of his belief about an ecocentric life, I would think, is today under question uh, because people are now calling it hashtag celebrity hypocrisy. Now, this is a fantastic thing because it, it uh, ensures some amount of truthfulness and honesty if our social media posts can be considered life writing in pieces. The example that I've quoted, there are plenty, but the example that I've quoted just now is an example for ensuring that all life writing has to uh, necessarily and it will fall under the lens of the public, the reading public and your followers, and has to necessarily uh, follow the path of truth over decades, ages, periods, whatever. My next thought. What are the different changing intents with, when it comes to life writing? Why do people undertake life writing? Why do we read or write biographies, autobiographies? Sometimes for cathartic effects, therapeutic effects, uh, if the Kashmiris, uh, we had some presentation some time ago, if the Kashmiri pundits uh, write, our moon has blood gods by uh, Pandita, Rahul Pandita. It is for a cathartic effect. It is because he wants to overcome the trauma that he's gone through. The Test of My Life by Yuvraj Singh. He wrote it majorly after he went through the experience of cancer and was able to come back to his cricketing life. So cathartic and therapeutic effects are one reason people undertake life writing. Sometimes it's confessions and self-exploration. I already have the example of St. Augustine and John Bunyan that we spoke about, so I will not linger too much on that. Uh, the next three points I want to put together under one example. I am Malala. We are celebrating the life of a little girl who fought for her education, for her basic rights, despite, uh, uh, despite the Taliban to record history because even through her celebration of her uh, special life, she's also recorded history in some sense, talking about the Taliban and global terrorism in one of its most uh, damaging phases. And it is inspiring, it is inspiring because it is a little girl. We know that she got the Nobel Prize because the book has been so inspiring to so many people world over. These are some of the positive reasons we take to life writing. But the last two, it sometimes can be for self-aggrandizement or because it is a, 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 a book is a commercial product that can make you the bestseller or sell million copies and make you rich overnight. For these two, I have some interesting discussion to make. Just yesterday, scroll dot in, if you read, you will come across an article by uh, Ramchandra Guha, a historian, uh, one who's uh, you know, dabbled many fields in Indian writing in English. He talks about how uh, one of the uh, earliest British anthropologists, who's the first expert in Indian tribals by, I think his name was um, one British anthropologist by name Irwin or Elvin, uh, I, I don't exactly remember now. So whoever that was, uh, when uh, Elvin, yes. So when Ramchandra Guha wrote his biography and kind of came to be known as a good biographer, um, 
he was in Gujarat for something and he got called in this article where he talks about commissioned biographies where you are asked or you are paid to write a biography and then you are bound by all the rules of the subject of your biography, right? So that's what he talks about there. And he says how the Adani, Gautam Adani uh, uh, group approached him to write a biography on Gautam Adani. And that was exactly the point in time when um, Prime Minister Modi was becoming the Prime Minister around 2013-14. And uh, he felt that it was, uh, it was, it was uh, for self-aggrandizement because Adanis also knew that once Modi came to power, their power would is likely to simultaneously increase. And that was the right time to have a, a biography come out on Dadanis. He also talks about how he was approached to write the biography of uh, um, a Prime Minister, late Prime Minister Vajpayee, and he was told how uh, it would be uh, a quick buck made because everybody in the nation would look forward to a biography of uh, Vajpayee. And then what Guha says, about, there are a lot of beautiful examples there, you could go read that up. But he ends the article, this is just yesterday's article. He ends the article by saying, in any case, I had an aesthetic aversion, aesthetic aversion to the idea of a commissioned or authorized biography. I would want to write a life of an individual because of my own inner urges, my own interest in that person, not because someone with deep pockets asked me to. This is what Ramchandra Guha says. So writing for self-aggrandizement or as a commercial product would be a wrong thing to do in life, right? Uh, I don't know how much time I have, ma'am. I have two or three more points to make. Ma'am, you can, can continue for five minutes. Uh, yeah, if you. you can wind up by yeah, five minutes, it's okay. Yeah, yeah thank thanks. You. Thank you. So uh, the next point, and I'll make it very quick. Uh, when you read life writing, how should you read it as readers? We must remember that there is a small amount of imagination that has this uh, come. In fact, um, uh, in the recent past, there have been uh, some critics who have come up with the term autobiographiction, graphiction, because they're adding your life, even if it is a plain event that happened in your life, when you're putting it in a book, you want to create the sense of drama. So as a writer, you, you, you also, also uh, uh, add your imagination to what you've heard or what you've gone through. So it's always important to take life writing with a pinch of salt. Memory was memory studies was was dealt at length by Dr. Marx. So I can actually skip it by just saying there is something called fragmented memory, episodic memory, because we sometimes remember certain episodes and not the entirety of our lives. There is fading memory and there is a, a disgruntled memory and there are different kinds of memories that come into play which lead to myth making. I start imagining that this is what actually happened in my life. 10 years after the event happened, if I haven't said it soon after it happened. Mm -hmm. Then there is a story and the importance of truthfulness. And I remember what Dr. Marx said, and I noted it to re-quote it here. He said there was a time when there was 50% uh, uh, of what was written could be believed. But now lies are in post-truth world. Lies masquerade as truth. So how true is the life writing that you're reading? And I want to point out one example as a word of caution to my readers. We all probably know the story of Lance Armstrong, the American cyclist, and he's written two books of autobiography. It's not about the bike, and the second one is Every Second Counts. And um, he talks about, he, you know, as, as a survivor of cancer and coming back to form after he recovered, uh, he uh, wrote all of this, but just a little after that came this book, Cycle of Lies. Mind you, Armstrong was a cyclist, right? Cycle of Lies, The Fall of Lance Armstrong, which got him mired in a huge controversy on doping. 
which he had kept a big secret in his books. So a lot of things that he had claimed in his autobiography was uh, were uh, proven wrong. And that's where I believe in what Carol and Weir says. The fiction cannot fail the truth test. Like I told you, if you ask J.K. Rowling, did Harry Potter really do this? It can never fail the truth test because she can always say yes because she created it. She invented it. Whereas for life writing to pass, it is difficult because um, we recreate reality in life writing. So be wary and let's be warned of the, uh, the dosage of truthfulness that is present in any life writing. Another point that happens is sometimes we have uh, co-authors and ghost writers. Look at Sachin Tendulkar and the dust jacket does not tell you that he co-authored it with Borya Majumdar. And look at the title page, the open page, and you find in small letters Borya Majumdar. In a scenario where Borya Majumdar is, is an expert in cricket, it has written books and volumes and is a cricket commentator, world famous. If you're writing your book with somebody as, as having a powerful voice as Borya, whose voice is the book eventually? Is it Sachin's or is it Borea's? It's a question to ask. Kevin Peterson, the cricketer, we know the famous book KP. He's also written it along uh, with a ghost writer, uh, probably uh, uh, David Walsh, an Irish sports journalist. It's the voice, uh, a sports journalist, mind you. So whose is the voice? And look at the irony, Lance Armstrong, openly on his cover page, tells us that he co-authored with Sally Jenkins when actually what he's written, a lot of it is lies. In fact, one of the conferences that was held some time ago on life writing was called Telling Lives, Telling Lies. It's the name of a conference. I just happen to remember when I'm talking about this. So whose voice is it? Is it the co-authors? Is it your own? Did he present it the way he wanted to present it? Has it been presented the way you actually went through it and narrated it to him, et cetera, are certain serious ramifications, complexities that life writing get into. There is also the complexity of the invasion of privacy because when I'm writing, uh, I'm also going to have in my life writing uh, friends and family uh, spoken about. Primo Levi, we all know, the Holocaust survivor, he generously uh, wrote about friends and family and didn't bother to change a single word of it, nor ask anybody's permission to write it. In contrast, the Seymour, who spent two uh, years after he made the draft of the book, sent it to every other person to who's mentioned in the book to ensure they are okay with what is written in the book. They're agreeable to what is in the book. Then there is uh, Crick. Uh, he was um, the biographer of George Orwell. He refused to begin writing until Orwell's widow signed a contract giving him complete discretion in what he's writing. Let's look at our own Indian example. The second example that I have here, Sanjay Abaru. He wrote The Accidental Prime Minister. He was uh, uh, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh's media advisor. And when this came out, I will uh, skip these slides. When this came out, he was asked, uh, to, uh, there was an interview and I picked two lines from the interview. Did the Prime Minister know about the book? And he says, no. He wrote an entire book on the prime minister of the country without the prime minister knowing of it. And when it got mired in a controversy because uh, people, the book review said that the prime minister is shown as a person who is a puppet in the hands of family politics. What Sanjay Baru said is my intent was far from what we have reviewed it as. It was with empathy to show what Manmohan Singh actually was that I wrote the book, not to show what he was not. And I've revealed only 50%. Look at the intent with which it was written. Look at the anonymity with which it was scribed in the first place. So does the prime minister's media advisor have the legal right to reveal details without mentioning to the prime minister? These are certain legal and ethical issues that one must ask when one studies and researches uh, life writing. And the last example comes from last month in the country. Pranam Mukherjee, our uh, honorable president, late president of India, uh, had his two um, uh, sequels, 
the turbulent years and the coalition years described by himself. But now when, they, when he passed on and they picked up his notes and his memoirs and they brought together the presidential years when he was the president, we know probably from the media in December 2020, uh, how his son objected to certain things said about the party and how the daughter of Pranab Mukherjee came up and said, we must be honest to what our father has written. The, the memoir should have what his notes have. So does the son or the daughter of the subject of your life writing have a say in what you're saying? Or is the memoir and the notes that you find the ultimate authority in what you're saying? What are the politics of what is revealed and what is concealed in life writing? These are some other issues to look at. With this, I shall bring my session to a quick and a hurried close. Uh, but I'm glad you could stay through the session. Uh, thank you so very much. I hope I have contributed to some amount of critical thinking in all of you who are dealing with life writing. Thank you, Fraternity of English, Mr. Jen. Thank you, Mr. It was, I do not know how to, you know, thank you for that extensively spoken, exhaustively touched areas of autobiography, because when our students do a research on autobiography, autoethnography as a social document, the testimonials as social documents, or, you know, based on, uh, uh, you know, nationalities or the celebrity status, or, you know, as you said, um, even when we examine the autobiography of a yogi or you know any sports personality or any film personality, we look at it from entirely different perspectives or angles. But whatever you have, you have been trying to trace the evolution of autobiography from East, the, the how it was looked upon or how it was approached uh, or attempted from biblical context, from the Indian context by Vyasa and Vatmeki. And you know, you have said. Uh, how it got reduced, it's shrinking now from, you know, from the, you know, where the autobiographer, indirectly we call what make as an autobiographer, it was actually about a dynasty, now it is shrinking to the individuals. Um, so there are lots of things, you know, the, the participants here, lots of things they have to think about, they have to explore, they have to read, they have to understand. Because uh, in the same breath, you know, you are on one side, you have a politician, you have, you have a sports personality, you have another celebrity, and you have, you are going, you are simultaneously visiting the Puranas, the epics, and from epic, you have come to the Instagram, touching the generations old and the new. So there are lots of things the participants have to think about to explore. I think, uh, I don't know, in one Q&A, they'll be able to uh, you will be able to satisfy their questions because I think you, they have to keep in touch with you and they have to uh, get connected with you to clear their doubts. So I would like to ask the audience, do you have any doubts now or shall we keep it towards the end? What is it? Would you be able to uh, keep it till the end or if you have any doubts, Lots of questions are there. Even I have lots of things to ask you, ma'am. But we will have some private sessions later. Definitely, we will. I'll keep in touch with you. Lots of things are there. Uh, so, Sorry. from the Madi, I think we should go ahead and let the others present. Fine. So, uh, I, I'm okay not to take the questions now or okay. whenever. Thanks. Thank you, ma'am. So, next is uh, Dr. Preeti Kumar. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, may I know uh, whether I'm addressing a majority of students or a majority of teachers? Both are there. I see. All students right. and teachers. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, without further ado, I'll go straight into my topic. My topic for the day is biopic. The biopic as ideology. Now, what do you understand by the term biopic? A biopic is a biographical picture. Uh, it's a fiction film uh, which deals with a figure who has a 
documented existence in history. That means you are, uh, you're dealing with a person who's actually existed in history and they have certain claims of fame or notoriety and that there is a uniqueness in their story. That is a biographical picture. Now I thank uh, Dr. Rani for having uh, you know paved the way for uh, for my topic because she's touched on um, she's touched on certain areas such as uh, the intersection of history and fiction and the idea of subjectivity that comes into biography. Now there are many other forms in which fiction and history intersect. You have the epic, you have a costume film, you have a docudrama. All these have historical characters. They have biographical tropes. The difference is that in a biographical film or a biopic, it is the individual story that is at the forefront. It comes to the fore. Now, uh, biopics, just like biographies, uh, written biographies, have gone from what was celebratory. As uh, Dr. Rani said, we started with the idea, the main idea of um, biographies were initially spiritual, the imparting of spiritual knowledge. It was moralistic and therefore it was not only, um, therefore it also had to be didactic. When it was didactic, what happened is it had to deal with certain, um, it had to deal with individuals who had celebrated lives. Therefore, uh, the biographies started celebrating their subjects then it moves on probably around about if we are looking only at western biographies it went on and round about uh, the time of Lytton strachi we come to what is called the what's and all biography meaning dealing with all the shades in a person's character and then we come to investigatory biographies we come to parodic biographies parodic biographies when we are uh, when we are dealing with a subject that does not warrant a biography at all it is almost a parody of the idea of biography then what we have is called the minority appropriation. That is when this conventional form of biography is applied to those people who would otherwise have been marginalized or stigmatized in the earlier forms of biography. Blacks, women, these are all, uh, the, they are all uh, what we call a, a part of the minority appropriated biographies. Now, uh, coming to biopics, uh, Vidal, Vidal in his 2014 text, the biopic in contemporary film culture, he calls it a troublesome genre. The biography or the biographical film, he said it is a troublesome genre. It is an intersection of history and fiction. The biopic style of historiography, you're recording a history, that is seen as suspect. You're trying to exemplify the historical life of a protagonist. You're trying to represent the biographical age, but is it actually true? I think when we watch biographical films, they, they tend to Google how much of it is actually true. So the biographic, the biopic style of historiography is seen as suspect. It is a very dubious attempt to capture a historical period in the life of the protagonist. On the other hand, there are many critics who state that a historical function is not only a historical document, it is a form of historical writing, such as Hayden White. Hayden White, who said he coined the term called Historio Forti, which is a counterpart to written historiography, stating that uh, it represents uh, the idea of history brought about through visual images, through filmic discourse. So in this sense, it is a very, um, as Vidal said, a troublesome genre. Where does it, where does it lie in the, in the genre of history, in the genre of fiction? You know, it's, it's hugely popular. Uh, if you look at the Oscar awards between 2000 and 2009, as some critics have noted, out of the 20 Oscars for best actor and actresses, 12 went to those who were playing real life characters. At the same time, it is a throwback to the old methods of storytelling. Now, some of these modes, uh, some of these modes are the classic tropes of life writing of um, the classical biopics. If you were to uh, research on biopics, some of these tropes that we must look at, uh, George Custon in his 1992 study, biopics, that is bio slash pics, how Hollywood constructed public history. That is the name of the text. He writes um, about, the, uh, about the particular tropes in a bio, biographical film. One, you begin in medias res. That is, the narrative starts in the middle of the story of the, uh, story of the personality. Then it's told in flashback. If you remember Gandhi, 
for example, or uh, Mary Kong, about uh, about which um, the, about which film I will have a little more to say later. It starts in the middle. It does not start with the birth of the uh, with the birth of the protagonist. The narrative is told in flashbacks, and you have embedded flashbacks to what are called the primal scenes. Primal, the most important, epiphanic scenes where there is a change, where the author realizes what, uh, where the protagonist realizes what he has to be in life. There are montage sequences which um, uh, which condense the rise and the fall of the subject. There are trial-like scenes where you show uh, the protagonist under pressure. That is what makes the biography um, the biographical film interesting, where the protagonist is under pressure and he has to perform. The historical character will verbalize his or her goals. That's how we know what he wants to be. Uh, then you have the classic voiceover. The voiceover you find um, uh, when you have particularly dramas. I was interested when we when we had the film. Um, I don't remember the name of the film. Um, uh, the cricket film. Uh, with Amir Khan and it's a fiction film, but it starts with the voiceover. Now the voiceover is a classic of a biographical or a historical film. Now uh, the uh, voiceover, which never returns after the opening, it tells you that this is the this is the situation, this is the character, this is where uh, this is the life of the character. It starts with a voiceover, which does not return. Then. Um, you have the opposition the opposition of the of the family of the protagonist the opposition that he faces he or she faces from society there are certain stock characters in a biographical film for example uh, a frequent character in a great man film is the wife the patient help meet wife who supports him throughout in female biopics similarly you have the figure of the mother the mother can either be supportive or she can be ambitious. Um, many times the mother can be significantly absent, significantly, the operative word is significantly. The fact that the mother is absent contributes in many ways to the life of the female protagonist. So now all of these are the, uh, are the recurring tropes that come into a biographical film. Uh, again, you have the confrontation between rivals, good versus evil. In, um, uh, I just saw, um, in the list of uh, the the list of books that Dr. Rani had written, the race of my life, the uh, the autobiography of uh, Milka Singh, and in Milka Singh, Milka Singh's um, Milka Singh's biopic, Bhag Milka Bhag, you have the classic trope of the biopic in the in the India versus Pakistan, in the India versus Pakistan uh, race at the end. Um, in Mericom, you have the match between Mericom and her German opponent. You have the German coaches who are very evil looking. If you look at the grammar of the cinematography, you will find that in their body language, they are shown as aggressive. They look down, the visuals, they look down, um, they had chins are down, but they are looking up. They're a classic trope of an evil character. There are confrontation with authorities who are unsupportive. I, again, uh, to come back to... Um, Dr. Rani's example of Harry Potter, uh, the uh, uh, the biographical film of uh, J.K. Rowling, Magic Beyond Words. You have the teacher, the teacher who tries to curb the author's flights of fancy. That's how she calls it. You have flights of fancy. And uh, there's another teacher who ridicules her drawing of a snake. So they, these are all classic tropes. These come into every biographical film. If you were to watch for it, you can. it's almost like a formula. Now, uh, this is how Kustin um, uh, speaks about the various tropes of the classical bio, bio of the classical biographical film. He also distinguishes between what he calls idols of production and idols of consumption. Idols of production: a man or woman who made great things for society. Lincoln, Edison, Patel. Ambedkar, these are idols of production because they produced something, they created something in society. Then you have uh, what Custom says is we are moving away from the idols of production and we are coming to the idols of consumption. You have an entertainer or sports figure. He is in effect, he is a consumer product. Conspicuous consumption. Now, the, uh, uh, we as spectators, we vicariously enjoy the lives of these, of these protagonists on screen. So essentially, what do we say about the biopic? Uh, the biopic narrates 
it exhibits, it celebrates the life of a subject. And it tries to question or interrogate his or her importance in the world. It tries to illuminate the fine points of his personality. And the appeal of the biopic is in seeing an actual person, the life of the actual person who did something very interesting in life, which was known only to the, which was known only in public. Then we are moving from the public into his private behaviors and actions. And this is put together and interpreted dramatically. And critics state at the heart of the biopic is the urge to dramatize actuality. Now, please note the term actuality to discover a biographical truth. It is an attempt to discover a biographical truth. We are not simply retelling the facts of a person's life. We are discovering a biographical truth. Now, this is where we come to the idea of ideology. What is this biographical truth? Is the truth objective? Does it even exist? Now, we know that uh, a biography uh, is both a mythologizing and a demythologizing form. You can create, there are narratives which are created and there are counter narratives which are created. So a subject is reconstructed in every generation based on certain mythologies and ideologies. Again, coming back to Dr. Rani's um, list, reading list, you had my experiments with truth, which is the autobiography of um, uh, Gandhiji. Look at the number of um, uh, look at the number of biographies of Gandhi. We have about eight hundred biographies of Gandhi. What are we doing essentially in those biographies? You are creating and recreating. No two biographies are, are like. Even though the person is the same, even though you're narrating the same set of facts. So what are we doing here? We are recreating the uh, the subject based on different mythologies, based on different ideologies. We are refining or we are debunking. The, um, uh, the myths, the popular myths of national and cultural figures. So when we think of biographies, you understand that there are many things that can go wrong with it. They can be manipulation, they can be flattery, they can be idealization, they can be inaccuracy, they can be distortion. And you have this proliferation of biographies across different media. And that shows that it can be foregrounded as a means of ideological and historical reconstruction. So every time, particularly biographical films, what we have to realize is that every biography written or visual is a means of historical reconstruction, reconstruction, which means it can be ideological. All life writing has its agenda, whether it is conscious or unconscious, whether it is uh, laudatory, whether it is uh, approving or whether it is critical. Across various periods, specific ideologies were reflected in um, uh, the biographical agenda of the time. We think of biography as objective, as impersonal, but we understand that it is problematized in practice. Now, postmodern theorists call into question this idea of truth, biographical truth, truth in general, they are the claims of biography. Why? Because essentially the life, when we talk about life writing, this life is filtered through the prism of the biographer's personality. Every biography represents the aspects of the truth as perceived by the biographer, depending on his socio-cultural subjectivity, his own understanding, his own sympathetic emotion, which he uses to interpret the data. There are facts but facts have to be interpreted. Facts have to be narrated. So biography, earlier seen as a recording of historical life, we understand that neither history nor biography is free of ideology. It is not free of subjectivity. There is no singular truth. There are only fragments. Fragments of a life which have to be given shape and form using certain rhetorical strategies. So facts, we must understand, can be interpreted. It can be narrated differently. That is the whole problem with a biography because it is not pure facts. It consists of interpretation and explanation of raw facts, which is transformed into historical narrative. The most effective way to influence opinion is through selection and arrangement of appropriate facts. Uh, E.H. Carr in What is History say, states that facts speak only when the historian calls on them. It is he who decides 
which facts to give the floor in what order and context so when you uh, when you create a, a narrative linking disparate incidents and events into an object into a coherent whole it might seem very objective but it produces meanings that the events themselves might not possess so what is the actual subject of the biography more than the subject itself more than the protagonist itself it is how the biographer has uh, has expressed the life so the first concern is not about the facts because facts does not exist in any true form but about the historian through whose mind these facts are reflected so the idea of uh, lies even though i might not call it lies itself let us not take any biography as an absolute truth even when the writer himself or an autobiography because even when the uh, even when an author even when a subject presents himself or when another person writes about him we must remember that there are certain facts which are foregrounded certain which are highlighted certain which are elided or omitted altogether so the narration of facts provides meaning to the raw facts the narration of events provides meaning to the raw facts of history that makes it ideological selection omission are the tools of the author therefore scientific objectivity is a myth whatever kind of biography that you are you are reading it is only a discourse a biography is a discourse whether it is written or visual how much more if it is visual you can imagine you are condensing a life into 3 hours therefore you have to highlight certain aspects and you have to and you have to relegate certain others to the background you have to select you need to suppress that is what you call the impurity of a biography and um another point um i know that we are running short of time another point that i would like to make is the idea of the reader the reader of the biography we've seen that the writer writes himself into the life of the subject it is through his personality that we get the life of another person the reader is also important biographical selection is made so that a story is narrated for a particular reader for a particular audience those are the biographical motives of the author so uh, the plot of the narrative is always depicted different is always different depending on the needs of a particular age if you have to watch the life of uh, uh, rani lakshmi bai then it will be different depending on the age in which it is written not only because of the biographer but because we are seeing rani lakshmi bai through the eyes of the present through the concerns of the present so uh, uh, the life will not have meaning unless it deals with our concerns not simply well uh, but to make it commercial but so that it is relevant for us why would i want to read uh, uh, the life of uh, any person or watch the movie of any person unless it makes meaning to me unless i understand how these how the present concerns that we have were dealt with in the past so the past and the present are in constant conversation so writers and readers are constantly conspiring to create and recreate the lives that they uh, that they read and uh, write about viewers or readers are not passive they are participating in the in the construction of meaning so the uh, reader is also important uh, another very important aspect is the language now uh, we know a life only through the language in which it is in which it is written and therefore as long as the scripting of the lives of people in a narrative that uh, uh, is done with language they are open to multiple interpretations and representations so we need to analyze closely the discourse semiotics the choice of words of visual images the grammar all these underlie the discourses of the text when we are talking about a biopic how has the how has the image been represented is it uh, um, is it a low angle shot is it a high angle shot what are the people who are foregrounded who are highlighted who are backgrounded where, where is the central character placed all these uh, where, who all are excluded so this is why you have a glut of biographies on the same subjects there uh, these biographies can be read or written differently depending on the predilections of the author and the mode in which it is written so this is the idea of 
ideology or subjectivity which comes into life writing, any kind of life writing, uh, whether it is an autobiography, whether it is a biography written or whether it is visual. Now, uh, within five minutes, I, if I may, uh, I would just like to present, um, uh, not present, I would just like to discuss um, the idea of ideology that comes into all kinds of biography. Now, different kinds of ideologies can be uh, can be brought into um, biographies, biographical films. Some are very obvious, uh, some not so much. Now, one aspect that I would like to bring in is the idea of gender, sexism in uh, biographical films. And the film that I would like to deal with very briefly is Mary Kong, simply because I happened to watch it recently. Now. Like a biographical text, gender must also be uh, culturally situated to be interrogated. When you talk about uh, biopics of female subjects, what we see is that whether it is made in India or whether it is in the, in the East or in the West, uh, to use two standard terms, they are full of the myths of suffering, of victimization of um, uh, the idea of failure, which is perpetuated by a culture where uh, there is a fear of women in the public public realm. You take a movie like Mary Com. Now, the biopic reveals certain standard truths. It begins in media's risk. There are embedded flashbacks reflecting primal scenes. You know, she, she, is, um, uh, she is in labor and she controls her pain until the curfew is over. And at this point of time, there is a memory of a boxing glove, which was picked up from a plane cash. So primal scene introduced immediately. The idea of, ide when we talk about ideology, the nationalist ideology is also brought in almost immediately because the insurgents which we have who are presented there, they are not initially presented very sympathetically. They are, they are the people causing the initial delay, getting Mary come to the hospital. The Indian army, on the other hand, is constructed more positively. Now, uh, but moving away from that, because we are talking about gender, female biopics find suffering and therefore drama in the woman's ability, inability to make her decisions, in, to discover her own identity. Look through most of the biopics that you have seen. That is a pattern for a feminist biopic. There is an ambitious young woman who goes against patriarchal institutions at every stage. You have in Mary Com the beginning of the uh, flashback, her father's words, when he, uh, when he asks, what are you going to do? Uh, when are you, what, uh, what are you going to do with, uh, uh, with your kind of lucky uh, And uh, he says, Bahar nikalne. Uh, these are the words that her father uses. So uh, the, the female biopics uh, play on the tension between the woman's public achievement and her traditional orientation to the home. She's constantly coming against patriarchal institutions at every stage. Similarly, if you might, um, if you think of um, Magic with Words, Magic with Words is the biopic on um, of um, J.K. Rowling, where her father tells her to consider a more practical major for her college, which will help her make a living. And he says, why don't you become a secretary? That is one major trope in female biographies. Again, another thing that we find in female biographies is the tension between a woman's public achievement and her traditional orientation to home, to marriage and motherhood. Now, this is where it becomes very, very insidious. This is where we need to read women's biopics very, very carefully. In Mary Com, you have a journalist who is asking her questions. He, she's talking about Mary Com as, uh, as a celebrated figure, as an example to women throughout India, uh, young girls throughout India. But when is she asking these questions? While she cooks, while Mary Com cooks. And Maricom is cooking and she says, if women get opportunities, they will be top in every field. Now, there is a radicalness in the statement like this. That is mitigated by, by her offering a romba, uh, a, a delicacy to the journalist. And the journalist eats it and says, Aap itne pakate bhi hai, uh, bhi lete hai. So that means you are not only good at uh, you are not only good at boxing, but you are a good woman. You are a good woman at home. So they have the food. The journalist comments on the taste. So 
uh, the whole idea is a woman has to be a woman. Maybe she is a public figure. Maybe she has won laurels in other field. But essentially, if you have to be good, there are certain other duties that a woman has. After marriage, again, you have Mary Combs, the trope of the good wife. She's sitting by the sidelines, cheering on her husband. When she becomes pregnant and she worries that her career is over, her husband asks her, did you, want, did you not want the child? And she comes out with a very essentializing statement. Uh, there is a moment of shock in her and she says, of course, every woman wants to be a mother. So there is this essentializing statement uh, where she has to be a good wife. She has to be self-sacrificing. So women's biographies, women's biographical films downplay their ambitions, their, initi their initiatives as traits that are unbecoming to a woman. Now, the ambitions are usually transferred to male associates. A success is a gift to a woman who does not seem to want it for herself. Even when she is, even when she is ambitious, it always comes secondary to her life as a wife and a mother. Now, in in Mary Combs' case, you have the husband. The genre of the woman's biography, whether in film or in literature, is infamous for displacing public ambition and achievement to male partners, to managers, to coaches. There, because. Women uh, are not allowed to want something which is non-nurturing, which is unfeminine as worldly success. So when her child is sick, when her husband Onla asks her to train for national, she says, how can you think of a match when the child is sick for two days? She trains only after the temperature returns to normal. Now the question is, uh, was it true or not? It's irrelevant. The, uh, the point is, this is what is being highlighted. This is being highlighted also. If you were to read um, again, when the various interviews that uh, Mary Con gives, she says that many of these, uh, many, um, uh, many incidents have been telescoped together, such as uh, the images that reinforce the traditional maternal image, where uh, you have when she, it, when she has a World Cup championship, there is a cross-cutting, cross-cutting between her child surgery and the match. The melodrama is another feature of um, a female biopic. You find that when the child's heart stops, uh, she collapses onto the stage. She opens her eyes only when the child's heart starts beating again. Now, this is a telescoping of two separate events. It did not happen at the same time. Why has, he, why has the director telescoped it together? to show that there is a maternal instinct. That is what is most important. She opens her eyes and what does she see on, what does she see before her? Her husband and two children in the stadium. That is what gives her the stimulus to fight. There is a cultural framework that sees marriage and motherhood as the woman's ultimate fulfillment that provides the most meaning. So here in, in this, you find that you can read ideology, the ideology of gender in, in a movie, apparently a biopic, but what is it constantly reinforcing? There is an ideology that is given. Now, any kind of film, uh, we do not have much time, therefore I'm stopping now. Um, any kind of film, you have them putting up, there will be an ideology that is a part of the narrative. Uh, another very interesting instance, uh, just to go back to what uh, Dr. Rani was saying, is Milka Singh's uh, sports biography, Bhag Milka Bhag. There also you have an ideology, even though it is not, it is not so much in your face. You have the ideology of masculinism. The great man, uh, the great man image, the masculinist mythology, martial power, strength, ability to respond um, aggressively. Uh, these are the these are the ideas that comes in there. The exemplar, uh, which it is the national hero, where he says, "May India Banunga, I will become India." He is taking up an oath. Um, he is dedicating himself to the nation. He is, uh, he is suffering as a masculinist trope. He is capable of in inflicting violence. He is capable of enduring pain. You can see that in the way he trains. Physically, he is superb. So all these things come in where yeah, you have in the body of uh, Milka Singh, you have the idea of India. These are and uh, these are some of the tropes of a masculinist ideology, blood as baptism into manhood. So you have various ideologies that come into various biopics. And uh, when we look at biopics, when we uh, when we uh, when we read biographical cinema, always remember there is an ideology behind the image. The question is, 
what ideology is it that the uh, the director or the filmmaker presents we do not read only the lives of the we do not view or read only the lives of the protagonist we also read behind those lives behind those lives there is a meaning that is that is communicated to us what is the meaning and that is what we need to look at when we look at biographies that is one of the things we need to look at when we look at biopics so um, uh, thank you very much i hope i have not exceeded my time far too much i am stopping here no dr preeti because unless we give you sufficient time what is required for you to explain what you have in your mind when you talk about ideology in biopic the purpose is lost still we know that you might go on for another half an hour because you have lots of things to speak uh, anyway what i understand that it was a perfect sequel to what uh, dr rani spoke uh, you know uh, and again you know for the students or for the researchers uh, you know all of both of you were talking about the veracity behind it the purpose behind it the truth behind it who whose truth is rather you know uh, finally uh, you know being pronounced and uh, what is the purpose of writing the autobiography what how is it shown or how is it seen is it through the lens of the 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 person about whom it is written or it is script uh, produced or from the perspective of the writer or the maker of the movie uh, that was any bit perfectly discussed then um, yeah and uh, you have touched on gender women and about uh, from the patriarchal point of view or from the patriarchal um, perspective you know how even with mary comb what happens what is the uh, what are the comments she got from her father because she was excelling in sports or rather in her own field she was uh, you know she was something incomparable but at the same time she becomes an ordinary woman in certain matter certain parameters are used there in even to judge uh, a character like mary comb or any other uh, people who make accomplishments in life so dr preeti thank you so much we'll get back to questions towards the end of the session so dr prayo good afternoon good afternoon is the slide uh, visible yes yes I'll sir the topic auto ethnography as method um i try to uh, be short and try to wind up by four um sometimes talking at the uh, at the end or uh, maybe being the last panelist is a blessing in disguise uh, i have many of my points uh, being elaborated in the previous two talks so i am going to theoretically actually build up on what actually uh, the other two speakers um, have explored uh, you are talking about a discipline that belong to anthropology uh, we don't usually talk about ethnography in literary uh, literature classes ethnography is a anthropological dis discipline if you are familiar with literary theory and if you are familiar with derrida's deconstruction his very famous essay structure sign and play discusses in detail a critique and an exploration of levi strauss's ethnography so ethnography is not a discipline that we are uh, we are oriented to but in relation to life writings in relation to self narratives anthropology makes a huge contribution towards life narratives and the importance of life narratives hence auto ethnography is very significant in understanding how a self narrative is related to culture or uh, how a self narrative is related to cultural formation first let us define what is ethnography ethnography is a written uh, scientific observation you talk to people who you be with them you understand them you collect cultural details 
and then you talk about the cultural formation of a community or cultural formation of a society. What is autoethnobiography? Autoethnography is a self-reflective writing that connects one's personal experience to wider social, cultural, political meanings and understandings. Now, the key relationship between uh, in autoethnography is a relation between self-narrative and how it contributes to cultural formation. In anthropology, autoethnography is considered to be a qualitative research. Uh, it is a it, it, it is similar to discourse analysis or it is uh, similar to phenomenological analysis it gets into minute details of what actually cultural symbols are cultural experiences are cultural uh, encounters are and then formulate the culture here i'm uh, trying to give few examples of uh, auto ethnographic writing and i'll explain to you one of these writings these writings are mostly published in ethnographic journals or these are writings, these are journals, uh, these are journal articles or these are uh, novels, these are biographies that have anthropological uh, in influences and implications. I'll take up Diana Patanda because uh, Dr. Preeti ended up uh, talking about Mary Combs Kitchen. Now, Mary, uh, Mary Combs kitchen and how Mary Comb becomes a cultural phenomenon or how she symbolizes culture is also related to how herself is con configured. In Kotanda, we talk about a mother's kitchen. Kotanda is a Cuban American diasporic. He, is, he immigrates to USA he moves to USA, he was used to mother's kitchen. Remember that the taste buds that we have are a huge contributor of uh, cultural uh, formation. Our taste buds are culturally important. Now, Kotanda reflects how he misses his mother's dishes, how he uh, mi misses mother's uh, confluently keep together her family through kitchen and cooking. So the cultural practices of Kotanda and his community is in some way or the other related to kitchen or food. Food is a very, very important cultural medium through which their community is closely related. Now in Herman, we, we think about, we, uh, we see about the father's ghost, the relationship between boy and a father. So most of these writings are uh, the cultural formations, are examples of cultural formations. Now I'm going to take up two different aspects of autoethnographic writing. One is how it uh, relates culture or cultural formation. In a literature class, we often bombard our students with cultural categories. This postmodern cultural categories, postmodern cultural concepts that are built on postmodern uh, superstructures. Most of the cultural categories that we use for our research, most of the cu cultural symbols and cultural significance that we uh, signifies and significance that we use are based on cultural categories that are that rest on superstructure of the society. For example, religion ideology, hegemony, all these are built on cult, uh, superstructures of society. But anthropologically, culture actually deals or cultural formation has actually uh, seen in a dual perspective, culture as super organic and culture as a collective. In super organic culture or culture as egocentric uh, phenomena, a culture as formulated within a psyche, versus culture that is contributed by the community. So when an anthropologist researches or understands a self-narrative, he would look for certain questions, certain signifiers that points to the organic nature of culture rather than the concepts that uh, define the categories or the, uh, the uh, superstructures of culture. Now, when you 
think about auto ethnographic writing when you read an auto ethnographic writing or when you when you write an auto ethnographic writing there are at least three questions that you put forward uh, the the fundamental understanding of culture or the concept of culture that a person uh, imbibes or has a writer has or an auto ethnographic writer has determines how one studies culture how one appropriates culture how one understands culture therefore it is very very essential to understand the individual concept of culture that is put forward by every in every auto ethnographic writing so every one of us has a concept of culture we are groomed in this culture we are we become the cultural agents and we are also the cultural products therefore our concept of culture determines our research our writing to the locus of culture where is culture located is an important question in, in auto ethnographic writing and auto ethnographic research uh, you all know that uh, the now famous uh, uh, book of homi baba the location of culture which is which is considered to be one of the masterpieces of cultural studies and post colonial studies it also deals with a very important culture a very important question where is culture located whether it is located in in the psyche whether it is located in ideology whether it is located in the in the power that uh, encompasses us whether it it it, it look whether the culture is located in the interstices in the hybridity or hybrid uh, identity of a person the location of culture is very very important Now remember that uh, the auto ethnographic writing is born in a cultural location, in a specific cultural location, and that determines how we understand a specific culture or how we understand how culture is formulated. Therefore, the locus of culture or cultural location is very important in understanding and in writing an auto ethnographic piece. Now, what are the boundaries of culture? when you read an auto auto ethnographic writing or when you research on an auto ethnographic writing we should be able to locate the boundaries of culture the boundaries of culture could be national it could be local it could it could be ethnic it could be linguistic it it, it could be uh, based on how memory plays an important role or how space how culture it could be understood as a spatial category so the boundaries of culture is very important for us to understand so when you read an auto ethnographic writing you should be able to locate and understand the different boundaries of culture now the second most important thing that even the previous two uh, two speakers have elaboratedly discussed is the notion of subjectivity now when i introduced auto ethnographic writing i told it is a self reflective writing it is a self reflective piece it is a self reflective uh, uh, presentation when it is a self reflective presentation it starts with a question who am i now from the literary theoretical perspective and from the western uh, system of knowledge self is a very important category we have different understandings of uh, self we have the psychoanalytic understanding of self uh, the uh, freud's ego theory then lacan's mirror image and then we have descartes's understanding then delusian understanding of rhizomatics we have different understandings of subjectivity we also have we also have uh, uh, the postmodern understanding of self and other so the question who am i is very essential in understanding an auto ethnographic writing it plays a very essential role as a writer and a researcher and as a mother now the subjectivity that you see in auto ethnographic writing is very visibly present we are not worried about any other thing except for the i in the writing that we deal with so the i is visibly present the self is visibly present we are talking about the cultural formation of an eye we are try uh, attempting to look at the uh, the cultural agency that relates to the eye or the self 
we we tend to understand the experience of a, uh, uh, the cultural agency or cultural agent that you see the eye so all these aspects all the experiences all the encounters that you see are visibly present in the text and you would see how visibly an a self is being formulated a self is being configured in this subject in an auto ethnographic writing we also see how a self defines uh, defines itself now this is i think this is the difference between a, a literary genre and an auto ethnographic uh, writing auto ethnographic writing allows gives the space to define oneself in in many of, of the writings we the the other aspects of the other literary aspects of writing uh, other literary boundaries of writing in fact contain to define oneself but here subjectivity is an open ended category which allows the subject to define oneself and we we see how a subject responds to itself rather than how a subject responds to things and categories and selves and others so a subject subjects definition and subjects uh, subjects formation you will be able to look at very closely and very explicitly and the third category that uh, i would i would uh, discuss existential difference of human beings in the next in the next slide also so i'll take up take up the the vulnerable subject aspect of subjectivity now auto ethnographic writing is a very important uh, uh, space for a vulnerable subject for a woman to speak up her experience for a ch child to speak up an experience for a dalit to speak up an uh, his or her experience auto ethnographic writing is a uh, is a source in this context i also want to point towards some of the auto auto ethnographic features that you would see in kamala das's writing i am a sinner i am a saint is a very a very very strong auto ethnographic statement she because that is how she defines herself that is how she responds her uh, herself to herself she is respond to, uh, responding to herself so she, the in i am a i am a sinner i am a saint you see a vulnerable a vulnerable subject that is visibly present in uh, and visibly uh, present in the formation of a culture next culture in subjectivity we also see the relation between self and other there are three ways of looking at how others are present in an auto ethnographic writing others are present in an auto ethnographic writing in three ways one as an auxiliary relationship in a supplement or a complementary relationship in some auto ethnographic writing you see others the other uh, subjects the the selves that you deal with it. others of the auto ethnographic writing participate or they become co participants and finally these others sometimes you would only see others in auto uh, auto ethnographic writing and the self is not in spotlight so remember that the presence of others is also contributing to the formation of culture it is not only self you will see a dialectic between self and others in some sense you will you will uh, you would want to go back to the lacanian psychoanalysis to see how a self uh, self is contributed or the the definition of a self is contributed to everything around us so as uh, the others also contribute to the culture the cultural formation finally how do you look at auto ethnographic auto ethnographic writing as a method i have put a put up four categories one auto ethnographic writing is an existential method our existence remember is uh, no more a contained water tight compartment it is uh, it is no more a, a framework our existence is plastic is liquid is ever moving ever expanding so we also in auto eth in ethnographic uh, research we also talk about cyber ethnography so that is how our existence is expanding however in the ever expanding existence of a human being how do we affirm 
our self how do you find ourself how do you define ourself how do you respond to your experiences your encounters with others matters so our research on autoethnography is an existential method it is not only a confessional method it is also a conflictual method our existence is not only a, a self affirmative ex, uh, in existence in many many times and in many ways we are all conflictual uh, human beings so our existence is a, is a conflictual ex existence we have identity politics we have uh, ideologies cross crossing we we talk about truth being multiple we talk about post truth we talk about post humanism we talk about uh, anthropocene how our existence is, is you know uh, ever expanding into other categories so our existence is not not just affirmative it is also confessional and it is also conflictual so this category of research or this category of writing or ethnographic writing is an existent existential method two auto ethnographic uh, writing is is an epistemological method now often times when we observe someone now sometimes we hear we often hear teachers telling i i no i can understand you from the way you look at no i can see your eyes and i can understand whether you are in the class or you are flying elsewhere now we actually tend to in set into an inquiry we are in a constant mode of inquiry wherever you go we are in a constant mode of search epistemology is not nothing but what we know how we know or how we know what we know either ways we know something how do we know that that process of knowing is an epistemological method so it is a process and auto ethnographic writing is also a process a never ending process where you set yourself into an inquiry the inquiry just goes within deep into you come out as a confessional uh, category of writing it could also uh, set out a confessional uh, set out of an inquiry that that goes out and explore into the culture three experience experience is the crucible in which culture is formed more most experience is is the fundamental to the cultural formation in 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 uh, in anthropology it is not only orienting experience many times most of the auto ethnographic writing talks about this orienting experiences most of the experiences are disrupting most of the experiences that we hear are uh, disturbing experiences remember that culture is not only a, 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 a sweet, super sweet uh, uh, account of experiences but is also it also include disrupting experiences it also talk about disorienting experiences it all it talks about fragmented experiences it talked about it talks about uh, disorienting encounters that a particular self has and finally auto ethnographic writing is 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 a process of signification it is a meaning making process uh, in a, in a post structuralist term it is it is also a meaning making process how do we uh, understand certain things and make meaning out of it you know we all search for meanings in our lives and most of the self narratives that you meet with or auto biographies that you meet with or biographies that we meet with is a discussion of how a particular self understands and grapple with truth for example or what uh, who am i is a search for meaning so auto ethnographic writing is also a search for meaning there are the meaning making process is ever ending is never ending in every moment in our life we are we are we are entering into a meaning making process a signifying process every encounter of us every experiences of us every conversation of us is a meaning making process and that is exactly what you see in auto ethnographic writing and you would see all these mothers auto ethnographic writing being an existential mother or epistemological mother or experiential a uh, mother or signifying mother or sig mother of signifying is contributing to the broader meaning of culture broader social meaning broader political meaning 
so auto ethnography is not just uh, uh, writing that is uh, a, it is not a close kind of writing but it open up opens up the in the cultural formation it, it is an open ended writing that actually uh, leads us into a journey or guides us into a journey a cultural journey where you understand your own experiences and how you make how you understand others thank you thank you so much elmo raj sir uh, you didn't directly say anything that you are leading the students to research but indirectly you have been working on it you you told them you told us rather about the i mean you started with uh, derrida you started with uh, levi strauss then you know slowly we were talking about stuart hall and uh, the boundaries of culture then at the same time you said you know we cannot define the boundaries of culture when you said about uh, like uh, yeah what are the boundaries of culture is it nationality ethnicity then language uh, memory geography even smell and taste everything decides your culture so as you said it's a meaning making process it's a continuous process it's a never ending process so uh, i think uh, you know the researchers will get more ideas um, about how to approach um, a not biography or in a, uh, or in a, uh, you know life writing and how the cultural theories have to be applied there in order to have a complete meaning of the text because you said the others not the other the others they also contribute a lot to create the meaning thank you so much sir i think uh, we can have the qna session now <laughs> anyone is having any questions any reflections yeah to as dr preeti hindu biographies though they are supposed to be just the factual capturing of a person's life when we first start developing our interest in the genre have to be seen as a complicit in certain larger than ideological scripts this is from vijayalakshmi um dr rani dr preeti and dr preyo why don't you come uh, you know why don't you uh, give some suggestions um on the possible areas of research probable areas of research as far as life writing is concerned but the possibilities are actually endless i mean uh, Uh, not only the question of ideology uh, which i have just mentioned where you can speak about various uh, aspects such as uh, questions of uh, nationality and uh, gender which i have uh, commented on but there are uh, there is other aspects also you know children's uh, biographies uh, sports biographies um, uh, again the biographies of the marginalized graphic novels uh, that's uh, that's a very interesting field of research um, where yeah you, are, you can actually speak about the very grammar of the uh, of the graphic uh, images that have been presented and um, again uh, there are also uh, the fields as i said uh, the parodic uh, writings narratives 
all these are various areas where you can you can go in and within these areas within these very broad areas again the possibilities are endless uh, you can also go into comics there are many many biographies that's a very very under researched area uh, are amar chitragathas you find that these amar chitragathas uh, in the way they present the national the lives of nationalist leaders mythological characters even that can be taken as a biography and uh, in the way they are presented how is it um, that uh, each of these comics represents the character how is the, an identity constructed for example very when i was doing my research on gandhi even though comics were not the area that i focused on i happened to uh, uh, happened to pick up a few comics on gandhi and uh, nehru in amar chitrakatha and very significantly when you look at the color dialectics you find that the darker shades are used not for indians but for dalits whereas when you look at uh, when you look at uh, uh, the indians the way indians like uh, gandhi and nehru patel and all these uh, figures are constructed and their uh, families they are all given fairer shades almost the same as the europeans so even the color dialectics can be a subject um, uh, can be a subject for a, for a paper for example so uh, within these broad areas there are there are smaller areas there are there are areas that can go into from, uh, Uh, much greater research where you can go into much greater research so the possibilities essentially as far as life writing is concerned are endless okay thank you dr rani i'm sorry dr preeti dr rani uh yes ma'am so dr preeti more or less covered uh, many things that can be researched in this area i was thinking of um are there differences between autobiographies and biographies of the same person the point of view approach shift in perspective when the life writer is different and that is a proof of what we said about imagination coming into this play into into play yeah uh there are also uh, situations where those who you know are in a particular career when you are a cricketer and when you are still in career you have a particular approach and when you are a retired cricketer you have a particular approach so uh, how much of that is visible in certain writings these are some other areas that uh, one could uh, explore i mean for example uh, a, a revelation versus concealment how much is it between autobiography and biography or uh, when you look at the life of a sportsman for example the same event if somebody is talking about the 83 india cricket or something uh, is the same event how is it seen by different people in different life writing texts so these are some areas that i would personally be interested in yes no uh, ma'am you have suggested by talking about dr manmohan singh's biography and also about uh, you know sachin tendulkar you know you are you are asking at the same time dr preeti when she said about you know uh, you know uh, through what lens or uh, the prism or perspective this is being projected so you are asking the students you know because actually reminding them of bacon's line read not to contradict and confute but weigh and assess okay you have to consider before you digest it so we have to understand as readers we have to be critical readers Who, what truth? Whose truth? Whose agenda is being projected by writing this? And also, autobiography and biography. You were, though you did not make the distinction, you know, by giving a subtitle to the distinct, I mean, to the two genres, both of you. But you made it very clear that autobiography, you know, it's one's own story written by oneself, and the other is written. It can be by anybody else. But at the same time, there are lots of difference in writing biographies. but the, it depends on the author who does it and what is the what is the reason behind writing the biography you have made it clear in your first point what why you chose it why you have decided to speak on it you made it clear there and uh, dr um, almuraj can you please suggest some of the research probable research areas i think most of uh, more, most of the uh, points that they have suggested are very valid uh, 
I think a couple of things that I want to study. One is how we understand cultural symbols and how uh, we understand cultural formation in autobiography. I'm trying to reiterate because we all carry cultural symbols in our stories, in our experiences, in our lives. We all carry cultural symbols. And I think that we, uh, that is an area of research that, uh, that we have to pursue. Two, uh, I think Dr. Preeti mentioned most of the research areas. Uh, space, I think, is a very important uh, research area. Mm -hmm. in, in an autobiography, you know, biography, when you tell your story, when you narrate yourself, when you narrate your experiences, especially for women, uh, especially for uh, uh, transgender, for, uh, for a child, space is a very important category. And space today has theoretical value, a personal value, and it also has cultural value. So uh, it is also an emerging, uh, emerging trend of research in the West, and we should also uh, talk about space and also how space is related to various other aspects of symbols, colors, and so on. I think Dr. Preeti mentioned most of it. Even the margin and the periphery, the center and the margin, Yes. <laughs> Madam, there's a question uh, here on the chat, in the chat box on my thoughts on silence. So if I can quickly uh, address that. Okay. Uh, so uh, my thought on it is silence in life is very different from silence in life writing. So the very fact that one has um, chosen life writing, let's say autobiography or a memoir or testimonial, shows that one is willing to lay bare one's life and its ups and downs, the, the gleams, the sheens, and the dark corners, all of it uh, laying it bare for the public eye. So in that situation, silence can be construed as concealment and concealment can be seen as lack of transparency exactly. and, such, and such a life writing can be questionable for its credibility and reliability, True. accuracy yeah. and precision. Absolutely. This is my thought. This yeah. is my thought. Okay. There is another question. Uh, It's a question for Preeti, ma'am, uh, about yeah. cartoon. Yeah. If somebody wants to do research in nationalism in any literary works, can you please suggest what would be the expected aspects to study? From Anitta Sahat, uh, if this is to Dr. Preeti. Um, I would rather not speak about literary works. If you don't mind, I would stick to the uh, life writing aspect of it. Um, one, we can always look at the sociological scope of uh, yeah, of uh, nationalism uh, going back to Benedict Anderson, Homi Baba and the new, uh, earlier theatricians. Uh, there is also the question of politics, how politics, uh, uh, politics are represented in cinema. The idea of unified identity, for instance, uh, you have this cinematic nation building. I'm focusing on cinema now. You can also talk about biographies. The idea of nation building. So there is a uh, there is a tendency to have a unified identity where the idea of the marginal, that marginal is usually erased. So um, there is a very interesting um, uh, there is a very interesting paper on fragmenting nations. The questions of terrorism uh, in Indian cinema. That uh, was a very interesting article. I don't remember paper. I don't remember who it was by uh, right now. But the idea of the marginal in cinema and how cinema is used uh, and history is used to construct a unified identity, how nationalism is constructed in films and in biographies and in history. Uh, again, as Dr. Elmoraj said, space. Spaces can also be studied 
um, extensively in uh, nationalism. Mm -hmm. Just to go back to Milka Singh's, uh, Milka Singh's itself, uh, bio biopic itself, uh, you have the vastness, the idea, uh, the idea of uh, mountains and uh, uh, the panoramic view. The idea of the panorama is where you are standing on, a, standing at a height, and you're looking down below, and you have this vastness that opens out in front of you. So, uh, even in the idea of a sports biography, you get the idea of India. Again, if you had speak about Sardar Patel's uh, biopic. Uh, uh, I, I don't remember the name of the biopic, Patel is a biopic, I think it was called Sardar. Uh, the naming of various, uh, the naming of various uh, states and cities, that gives you the idea of an India that is, that is unified. So space becomes a very interesting area of study when you're studying nationalism. Again, the sixth body how uh, a nation is represented in the body of the protagonist. Questions of inclusion and exclusion, whether it is a race or age or gender or class, all this can come into the study of nationalism. Uh, this I'm only dealing with uh, cinema and uh, biography because these are my areas. I've not actually gone into detail in the study of uh, nationalism in literature itself, but these themes, these are the themes of the nation that you can, you can always explore. The idea of the body is um, extremely popular now as, a, as a, uh, an area of research because we see how, whether it is a male body, which is a part of the great man biopics, or the female body where the idea of honor is invested in the body of the sexed female. Or these have become very pertinent questions when we study nationalism. Again, as far as the marginalized are concerned, how is it that the marginalized are made a part of uh, the nation at the same time even in creating the marginalized as a part of the nation appropriating there is a process of appropriating their voices so nationalism these are some of the areas that i can think of right now uh, when you are um, studying nationalism researching nationalism okay dr preeti there is one more question can we consider cartoons based on the great persons as biopics uh, no, not biopics, because when we talk about biopics, we are talking about biographical cinema. These are just graphic biographies. We can think of them as graphic uh, novels. Cartoons, um, uh, I presume you're talking about one panel cartoons. Is that the question? Mira, I think Mira is asking. You're talking about one panel cartoons, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, uh, these are these are graphic. They are graphic narratives. Biopics we refer. It's a technical term, essentially only for cinema. But definitely, that's a very interesting area of research. Uh, cartoons, uh, yeah. how various figures, nationalist figures, particularly, have been represented in their in their different cartoons in different uh, countries by different cartoonists. You can actually have an entire study of a, of a single cartoonist uh, or of a single national figure or uh, any other kind of figure. It's a very interesting area of research. Some there, there are people who have done um, there, there are people who have done studies solely on the uh, cartoons of Gandhi during the nationalist movement. Uh, uh, cartoons which have come in on Punch and various other Indian magazines. It's an interesting area of study, but they're not biopics. Um, and Dr. Preeti, you have, uh, you have certainly reached the 21st century students uh, through the examples you, know, you have elaborately quoted. You could read them successfully. Okay. I think there are no more questions from the participants. There is one on trauma study, ma'am. Okay. One on trauma study. Yeah, the scope of trauma study handled in biography and autobiography. That's oh. a question. Dr. Priti, do you oh. want to go? Shall I? Work? I think uh, Dr. Raj perhaps could yeah. be. Correct. Because it's talking about autoethnography and. Uh, Several several factors contributing to create the meaning. Dr. Raj? Yes, ma'am, yes. Trauma is a very, uh, very important area of, uh, area of research currently. Because most of the, uh, the uh, 
the disciplines that come under area studies, for example, post-colonial studies, yeah. or Dalit studies, subaltern studies, feminist studies, all deal with disturbing experiences. And when you borrow or bring in biographies, self-writing, self-narratives, life narratives into those broader categories, you also get a broader understanding of how trauma uh, is in, uh, instilled on a person or how a, a trauma is experienced in a, uh, in a person from a different category. So when you understand, try to understand biography or autobiography uh, as a life writing, I think you should also uh, try to understand the trauma of a person, uh, the account of trauma interdisciplinary. I think when you interdisciplinary try to understand trauma, the scope of studies uh, becomes, becomes wider. So when you bring in uh, the post-colonial understanding of trauma or feminist under understanding of tra trauma or the, uh, the subaltern understanding of trauma, or the LGBT and the queer understanding of trauma, you will be able to further understand what exactly uh, a self is trying to uh, narrate in an autobiography or autoethnographic writing, or uh, how a traumatic account is narrated in a biography. Mm -hmm. So I think, I personally think trauma, to, in order to understand trauma in an autobiography or a biography, you should, uh, you should get into an interdisciplinary study, bringing in other categories of research, other concepts and other methods, uh, so that you'll be able to further push on this, uh, the implications of trauma in a particular uh, uh, subject or particular character or particular person who narrates the, uh, uh, narrates the account of trauma. So some parallel reading of other texts would be inevitable there. Yes, yes. Okay, so if I may add a line to what uh, Dr. Raj said, uh, trauma studies is actually branched out. Trauma literature has almost literally branched out of life writing because everybody who's writing about trauma of themselves of others, it eventually it comes under the umbrella term of a life writing. And the three things that happen in trauma studies is you have the event, you have the experience, you have the effect. Yeah. While historical records will give you only the event. It mm. is only life writing uh, under which you have the trauma literature, which talks to you about the experience and the effect of it at all. Mm -hmm. So there is a very big scope for study of trauma from a biographical, autobiographical, uh, broad, generic perspective. Mm. Thank you, ma'am. So, so thank you so much. Uh, I'm proud to, to be the moderator for, I feel extremely delighted to have, uh, you know, having got an opportunity to be with you because uh, three of you, I should say that one was complimentary, one was actually adding on to what the other person has spoken and really, uh, the panel discussion, it was done in detail. It was not for 10 minutes or 15 minutes. You had extensive papers to read and extensive topics to talk about. And, you know, it was specially directed towards some very passionate researchers, all the three papers, very passionate researchers. So thank you very much, Dr. Rani, Dr. Preeti, and Dr. Kumar for your valuable I should say words and uh, you know suggestions and knowledge that has been imparted and shared on this platform. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, all of you from Crystal Dendi and participants. Thank you so much. We have come to an end of our panel discussion for today which also bring us to the end of day one of our virtual national conference. I take this opportunity to propose a sincere and heartfelt vote of thanks to everyone gathered here on this virtual place. A special thanks, no doubt, goes to our esteemed panelists who have taken all 
valuable time of their respective schedules in order to share their perspectives on this topic and add to the continuation of the dialogue on life writing. Thank you, Dr. Rani PL, Dr. Preeti Kumar, and Dr. Prayer L. Maraj. Dr. Krishna Prabha, ma'am, thank you for moderating this panel discussion and guiding it along with your expertise. I thank the principal, Reverend Father Augustine, for providing us with the opportunity and guidance to conduct this virtual national conference. I also wish to extend a deep felt gratitude to the deans, department coordinators, faculty members, participants, paper presenters, and our dear students for providing all the support and for the enthusiastic participation. Thank you all. We will meet again tomorrow for the second day of our conference. Hope to see you all tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.